Hi, and welcome everyone to our virtual live at Frost Science. We are so happy to have you here with us today to join us as we welcome Dr. Jonathan Block. Today, our virtual live at Frost Science is presented by Miami Downtown Development Authority and is done in partnership with the National Park Service and with the University of Miami, or oops, sorry, University of Florida. <laughs> I live in Miami. <laughs> Uh, with the University of Florida. And so we are so excited to have these wonderful partners to celebrate the 11th anniversary of National Fossil Day. How exciting is that? Good morning, Dr. Block. How are you? Good. Good morning. Oh, actually, it's afternoon. Where am I? I'm like in a different <laughs> time zone today. I'm always up for a good morning. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. So we are so excited to have you here with us today. And there is so many exciting things that you've done. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and what interested you in fossils in the first place? Sure. Uh, so I, I grew up in Northern California um, in sort of what was then more of a rural part of Northern California, North San Francisco. Um, and I was sort of surrounded by nature growing up and I developed a pretty deep appreciation for um, the natural world and um, what happens when you're a kid and you're interested in nature is you start asking a lot of questions. <laughs> and it's kind of fun uh, when you realize that there weren't any really great answers to a lot of the questions. Um, so to me, it became a little bit of a, you know, kind of a game um, to try to figure things out. And, uh, and, and one of the things that was also very interesting to me was, you know, trying to understand things that had happened in the past. And I was always interested in old things. So when you put those things together, um, uh, it kind of converges on uh, vertebrate paleontology or paleontology in general, um, because the fossil record is a lot of mysteries. You know, you get sort of pieces of the of the picture that you need to then sort of put together, um, and allows you to understand what the uh, history of the natural world might have been going back in the past. So my first experiences when I was uh, younger. Um, that really started to form in my career path uh, were uh, as a volunteer at the La Brea Tar Pits in Los Angeles, um, wow. where um, at sort of the later part of when I was a high school student, I volunteered in the, at the Page Museum there. And that gave me the first insight into how one could pursue vertebrate paleontology as a professional, which I then started on that track at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and then, and then onward. Um, and I was inspired and the rest by a great number of yeah, the, the rest is history, the rest is history. With, with a few of with a few really important interactions with teachers along the way that um, fueled that interest. That's amazing. So to tell you all a little bit more about Dr. Block, he is the curator of vertebrate paleontology and chair of the Department of Natural History in the Florida Museum of Natural History, which is in Gainesville, Florida. And he's an affiliate professor in the departments of biology, anthropology, and geological sciences at the University of Florida. So just a few jobs there, just, just a couple. Um, Dr. Block received his PhD in geological sciences in 2001 at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. He did his postdoctoral research in the Museum of Paleontology at the University of Michigan. And as a Haslam, did I say that right? Haslam, uh, postdoctoral research fellow at the South Dakota Museum of Geology and Department of Geology and Geological Engineering at the South Dakota School of Mines and Technology in Rapid City. He joined the faculty of the University of Florida in 2004, and Dr. Block studies fossil vertebrates from the Cenozoic with an emphasis on addressing questions surrounding the first appearance and early evolution of modern orders of mammals, including primates. So with that, I'm gonna let you take over the helm here and lead us into your exciting talk, which is titled Extinction of the Dinosaurs, Global Warming and the Origin of Primates. So please take it away. All righty. <clears throat> Okay, can you see my screen? We can, you are good. We're good to go. Okay, so I tend to start, uh, to start this lecture, it's a little bit of a bait and switch. I know everybody wants to hear about dinosaurs and I'm so focused on mammals, but I think it does logically uh, start in the world of dinosaurs. 
Um, so what, what do I mean by that? Well, if you look at, uh, If you look at a broader picture, um, if you think of the, about geologic time, um, this is zero, so that's today, um, going back 600 million years. This marks the first appearance of animals in the fossil record. And through that six million year history of animals, um, we've had five, what we call uh, five um, mass extinction events. So these are big extinctions where you have a lot of things go extinct, way outnumbering the things that um, are, are appearing in the fossil record. Um, and the ones that we want to, that I'm, that I want to focus, well, we had, we've had five that are illustrated in the fossil record. And part of the conversation is whether or not we might actually be at the early stages of even a sixth uh, mass extinction. And that's been the, the part of a lot of discussion and debate um, as we exist in this new Anthropocene. Um, but the, the mass extinctions that I, want to, that I want to highlight here at the beginning of this talk are the end Permian event at around 250 million years ago, and then the end Cretaceous event here at about 66 million years ago. So the end Permian by, all, by any way of looking at it was just an absolute disaster for life on earth. Um, it happened about 251 million years ago and the bad news uh, that uh, for, for if you're interested in life on the planet is that of the 48 uh, tetrapods, the animals with legs on land, uh, families, 36 of those families went extinct. So 75% of the families um, on the planet of tetrapods. That, that means 95% of all the species went extinct. Um, and that happened in geologic time fairly quickly. Um, I know it seems like a lot, but we say in less than 500,000 years, it could have been a lot quicker than that. So why, you know, why did that happen? We're not entirely sure, but it probably had something to do with um, greenhouse gases going into the atmosphere, probably the result of uh, volcanism um, and uh, then global warming. Um, and this has been called, you know, uh, when life nearly died in, in some popular books. There's good news though, after an ex mass, this mass extinction event, which is that um, let's look at the things that survived. So 25% of the tetrapod families survived. Uh, this began what we call the age of reptiles or the beginning of the Mesozoic. And, uh, and then soon after in around 220 to 230 million years ago, those survivors gave rise to what we now recognize as the oldest crocodiles, dinosaurs, and most importantly, from my perspective, the oldest mammals in the fossil record, right there uh, in the age of reptiles or the time when dinosaurs were alive, as, as many people think of, of the Mesozoic. And I love this mural here from the Yale Peabody Museum, um, which uh, is actually in reality about 110 feet long, um, which, is a, which is an attempt to summarize beautifully um, what all of the animals and plants would have looked like through that, um, through that long history of the Mesozoic. So when I first started uh, studying um, mammals, this was the uh, main reference for understanding mammals from the age of dinosaurs or Mesozoic mammals. And it was published in 1980. And for, for, you know, the, for what represents essentially the first two thirds of all of mammal history, um, it uh, was only about 320 pages long, which um, which is not very much as a complete summary for you know, such a major portion of the evolutionary history of mammals. And the general idea back then when, when we didn't know very much was that mammals were skulking, um, uh, you know, there were small insectivores that they were trying to hide and not get eaten by you know, theropod dinosaurs. Um, and that most of the ecological diversity on land was occupied by, uh, by other types of animals, but not mammals. And this is uh, put up against the fact that uh, if you look at molecular clock estimates based on molecular data um, from, the DNA, from DNA, uh, what they suggest is that primates may have lived actually during the time of dinosaurs. Primates are the group that we're part of. So we're ultimately we're talking about the group which separated from the rest of mammals and ultimately, if you think that way, led to us. Uh, so it's, it's intriguing to think about our um, some part of our ancestry extending back into the age of the dinosaurs. And here's an attempt at a reconstruction. Since we have no fossils during that time, 
uh, is attempted a reconstruction of what that animal might have looked like, a small body animal in the trees, potentially hunting for insects, not so much, you know, a human uh, primate interacting with, with dinosaurs, as you see here, but something which are not, is not automatically recognized as a primate. But that's fairly cryptic because we don't actually have evidence. But do we have a question? We do. So that kind of looks, the one before kind of looked like a possum to me. This one kind of looks like a lemur maybe without the, the tail. Is that kind of what they were looking like back then? And how do we know that? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the marsupial, so the, the possum looking thing, um, you know, we definitely know that they existed during the time of the dinosaurs. So um, that's by analogy to the way things look today and doing our best guess of, of what they might might look like. Um, in some cases, we have skeletons, so you can do a fair approximation of the way their, their bodies would have looked, but in other cases, they're just pieces of teeth, um, and so you have to infer a lot from that just based on what they might be related to. In terms of this hypothetical reconstruction of the common ancestor of living primates, it's purely hypothetical and really just goes um, based on the way things look uh, in early on branching in this, um, in this tree of life for, for primates. So in 2004, this was very revolutionary. And I remember when this came out because everyone was so excited because you know it doubled our knowledge of Mesozoic mammals. This was a giant summary by Sofia kielin yavorowska and Rich Tfeli and Zeshi Lo, where they brought together everything that had been discovered since 1980 and before into this giant, you know, giant um, summary of what mammals were like from the age of the dinosaurs and 630 uh, pages of, of bliss. Um, what they illustrated was things were a lot more complicated than we thought and a lot more interesting. They weren't just little, uh, you know, small insectivorous mammals, you know, under logs hiding from dinosaurs. But in fact, um, and even since 2004, there have been well over 100 new papers, probably a lot more than that, on Mesozoic mammals. Um, and what we now understand is that there's a huge diversity, a huge ecological diversity of mammals that lived during the age of the dinosaurs. Uh, there were mammals, and we have compress we have body fossils that were that were that have been preserved in China, um, in deposits in China, for example, where you can even see outlines of the soft part preservation. Um, so we have a pretty good understanding of what their bodies would have looked like, and um, what we're understanding is that many of them had these ecologies that really mirror the type of ecologies that we see in mammals today, um, including mammals that were semi-aquatic or uh, living part of their life as uh, swimming. Um, mammals that were climbing in trees, even mammals that were gliding, like sugar gliders or flying squirrels today. Uh, also mammals burrowing. And this is one of my favorite depictions of a Mesozoic mammal. It's a little blurry here, but really what it's meant to illustrate is a Mesozoic mammal that was eating a dinosaur. So a mammal large enough uh, that was carnivorous to eat, to eat a dinosaur. So not necessarily hiding at all, but uh, a little payback there. Uh, but what we now know with that much more, much deeper understanding of what Mesozoic mammals look like is that we still don't see any clear, uh, we don't see much evidence that clearly ties the modern diversity of mammals back into the age of the dinosaurs. We don't really see evidence for the modern orders of mammals. And specifically, we don't see uh, any ancestors of modern primates, which the molecular um, data would tell us should be there. So then moving uh, to this wonderful event, if you're interested in, in modern mammals, which is the extinction of the dinosaurs. You have this bolide impact, that's uh, giant rock smacking into the earth. And the fallout from that uh, was to uh, wipe out a lot of, um, a lot of vertebrates, so, many, so much so that we characterize this as a, as a mass extinction event. Um, so dinosaurs, pterosaurs, which are related to dinosaurs, but but we're flying, um, evolved flight separately from, um, from the more derived bird dinosaurs. Uh, marine reptiles were wiped out, um, but what did survive is what of course is interesting to us from our you know, modern day perspective. And that includes uh, mammals and also birds, but most specifically mammals. And so this red line, this is a time scale. So here's the Mesozoic and here's the Cenozoic, which that name was brought up before. Uh, this red line is the extinction of the dinosaurs, the KP, what we call the KP boundary, um, the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary, uh, at about 66 million years ago. So that line marks the extinction of the dinosaurs 
all of that beautiful diversity of mammals during the Mesozoic happened down in here with only very little evidence. You have, you have evidence for lineage leading to modern uh, monotremes. You have evidence for um, uh, lineages leading to modern marsupials. But within placental mammals here, uh, you really don't see any clear tie to things that are uh, you know, during the age of the dinosaurs. And their major radiation uh, really uh, dramatically first appears in the fossil record. Um, starting even within the first 100,000 years or 200,000 years of the KP boundary and the extinction of the dinosaurs. So if we keep our focus on primates for, 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 this, for a second, you know, our ancestors, uh, they appear, uh, the first modern primates, to, uh, we do see some things that are more archaic, but the first primates that are absolutely for sure related to uh, primates that are alive today appear about 10 million years after the extinction of the dinosaurs. That's during a period that we call the Eocene, when it was a lot warmer than today. So what do we mean by that? OK, so this is, a, uh, on the surface, a fairly complicated graph that I'll just break down for you here of past, and it was published fairly recently, of past and future trends in global mean temperatures. So what you're seeing here, um, you see zero, negative four, four, eight, 12, 16. These, are, um, these numbers represent differences uh, for, of average temperature from 1961 to 1990. So they took the average global temperature from, from 1961 to 1990. And then uh, along this time scale here, which goes from the future all the way back to the, you know, all the, way back to the KP boundary, um, they're looking at deviations from, from this average that they calculated from 1961 to 1990. So you can see, so the zero is that is, is the 61 to 90. You can see if you go way up here, this is a lot warmer, you know, in the past than it was, you know, when they, when they did the average, which is right here. So um, this bracket here of this, of this curve uh, represents, um, temperatures that were derived from deep sea records using stable isotopes as well as other uh, proxies. And it spans from the extinction of the dinosaurs all the way to about 25,000 years ago, which is right here. Then you have a break where the scale changes. Um, these climate data here are derived from ice core data from about 25,000 years to 1850. Um, then here from 1850 to now um, are historical records of climate. And then what you have here, which is very interesting, is the future. So, and that's why you have a bunch of different lines here because there's a lot of variables and we don't know exactly what the future looks like. And it's hard to predict the future. But these are various attempts at uh, what climate might look like in the future. So let's look at the future part of that graph for a second. Um, what the future tells us is that, uh, and we'll just ignore this upper line here. Let's just say that it won't get this bad. Um, and let's just focus on these ones here, which are a bit more likely. Uh, by 2300, um, the current Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Models, so the IPCC models, predict average temperatures to be in, at least in the range of 19 to 14 degrees Celsius or 16 to 25 degrees Fahrenheit higher than that of today. That is on average during, during a year, not minimum, maximum, but on average. Dr. Um, Block, real yep, quick, a, a screen popped yep. up. Nope, a screen popped up on yours. That's ConnectWise Control. <laughs> it needs you to dismiss it. Oh, I don't see the screen, sorry. Okay, continue. Uh, sorry, where is this? What does it say? I think it's good, I think it's good. Okay, all right. All right, so, um, that's a lot higher than today. Um, and to put that into some perspective, I was trying to put this, and this isn't exactly the correct characterization, but it's, you know, because there's a lot of variables in terms of the amount of rain and things like that. But if you were to compare the hottest place on earth, or one of the places that's been cited as the hottest, hottest place on earth in Ethiopia here, um, compared to Gainesville, Florida, that's about the difference that you're talking about. So, if you go from Gainesville to the hottest place on earth, that's about the difference you're talking about projecting out to 2300, everywhere on the planet. Um, and I'll just say the hottest place on earth in Ethiopia is not exactly the best place to be alive. 
So this will potentially bring global temperatures up to way beyond what humans have experienced so far in terms of their time on the planet, prehistoric history included. Um, and, and, actually, uh, and actually way beyond a lot of mammal evolution to a level the planet has not seen uh, in about 50 million years. Um, and this was a time when there was no ice on the poles. Um, we have to go back to where these lines indicate here to, to, get, to, to get to that to that interval when the earth was last that warm. Um, this was a really uh, interesting time. Um, it, was, it was a great time for mammal evolution, um, but this was also a time when there was no ice on the poles. So we, we call this a, a hothouse world. Um, so you can imagine uh, you know, the Arctic um, looking something like a South Carolina swamp with enough uh, precipitation up there. This is uh, Inuit holding a picture of a South Carolina swamp in the Arctic for juxtaposition of how different that would be. Um, so the question that we have as paleontologists, uh, one of the questions that we have is then, what happens to life when the Earth gets that much warmer? You know, if that's what we're projecting for the future, then um, then we have to travel back in time, you know, in the fossil record and in the geologic record to see what the planet was like when it was last that warm. We can't we can't wait for that future to happen to see what that looks like if we're trying to prepare for uh, how that might affect uh, plants and animals on you know on Earth. So time travel. Uh, so where we're going to travel uh, with the remainder of this talk is to Wyoming. And so here's this bracket of time, and I've circled this interval of time that I'm especially interested in, which is the interval of time between what we call the Paleocene and the Eocene in the Cenozoic. And I'm interested in that um, because that marks also uh, what we call the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum, or for short, PETM, which happened 56 million years ago. This was a large very quick from our perspective, global warming event, that is a geologic perspective. Um, and you know, the bottom line, this was a lot hot, hotter than it was today. Um, so what caused this global warming event? What we know is that there was a lot of greenhouse gas that went into the atmosphere very quickly. Um, uh, and when I say very quickly, we have a resolution that it was at least as, as little time as less, as less than 20,000 years, but it could have happened a lot quicker than that even potentially as quick as uh, we're experiencing global warming today. And then it lasted for about 200,000 years. And then the increase was about five to eight degrees Celsius. Yep. So a quick question we have is, did this have any impact with, um, did this onset of this global warming happen due to the impact from the meteorite that hit or that big impact that was related to that mass extinction? Or was this something that was already in progress and that didn't really impact it? Yeah, so this is, um, that's a good question. And I'm glad uh, for an opportunity to clarify that. So this is 10 million years after the impact that destroyed the dinosaurs. So we had, we've had mammal evolution going on for 10 million years, the beginning of what we call the age of mammals. The dinosaurs are long gone, except the, the avian ones, the birds. Um, and so this is a separate event that has nothing to do with the impact. Um, so what caused uh, this global warming event is hotly debated, um, but we do know that it was not uh, man-made because there were no humans on the planet. Um, and we also know that a lot of light carbon um, went into the atmosphere from greenhouse gases and, uh, and resulted in a, a rapid, large-scale global warming event. So what we're gonna do now is go back to this time, 56 million years ago, 10 million years after the extinction of the dinosaurs, to, to look at um, with the idea that, uh, so, so we're gonna go back to, to 56 million years ago. And to do that, we're gonna time travel to the Bighorn Basin um, where we're gonna be documenting uh, how mammals responded to extreme global warming um, to, uh, so we can understand uh, how mammals might respond to climate change um, back then and we hope uh, if we can look for things that rhyme as we look through the fossil record at times during global warming, um, that we develop some predictive power for the future. So these, uh, what I'm gonna show you here is the result of uh, Florida Museum of Natural History expeditions to the Southern Bighorn Basin um, running starting in 2003 all the way through 19, only interrupted recently by COVID. 
and where we're going here, uh, this little square on this Google uh, Earth image here is uh, supposed to be around Wyoming. Um, in north central Wyoming, where this little square here is, is notched, there's a big, a big depression, a big basin, which is surrounded by mountains, an intermontane basin in the Rockies. And uh, for those of you who have been out west um, and uh, visited Yellowstone, for example, you might know the town of Cody, which is right here, which is uh, right outside one, the entrance of Yellowstone. Um, and uh, then we have the, the Grey Bull River running through um, this giant uh, depositional basin filled with uh, sediments and fossils. Um, and, then, uh, and then a lot of our work is around the town of Warland right here in, in the Southern Bighorn Basin. So how do we collect mammal fossils in the Bighorn Basin to start uh, thinking about uh, these questions? And I see uh, we have another question that just popped up. Yes, we do. So we're wondering how do you find one of these spots in the first place to even know to go there to look for um, mammal fossils? Like how does one even get discovered? Yeah, so the Bighorn Basin is absolutely extraordinary and it's been st studied for, you know, 100 and 50 years people have been collecting fossils in the Rockies. Um, the, uh, the Bighorn Basin is absolutely extraordinary. Um, this is sort of what it looks like when you, when you get there. So, um, and what you're looking at are rock exposures uh, because it's a very dry place and there's a lot of erosion of, of these ancient soil horizons. We call them badlands. And, um, and one of the incredible things about the Bighorn Basin is pretty much wherever you walk around uh, in these ancient soil horizons, you'll see fossils of vertebrates eroding out of these ancient, you know, out of these rocks. So people who live in the Bighorn Basin um, have them, very, you know, have them right there in their backyard. It's common. You can anybody who's who's grown, who grew up in this part of Wyoming uh, uh, knows what it's like to collect a fossil because they're everywhere. Uh, they've been studied for a long time, so we knew we had Paleocene. When I started this project, we knew we had Paleocene mammals and we knew we had Eocene mammals in various parts of the layers of the rock. So our focus was to, was to focus in on that transition between the Paleocene and Eocene, uh, which is associated with this climate event. So we just went to the place where those two types of, uh, of animals existed and then looked in between um, and tried to find a chunk of the fossil record that, um, that represented this, uh, what we call a hyperthermal event back there 56 million years ago. But how do we collect these fossils? Yeah, how do we, how do we find them? And, and um, we start with people, you know, we put people in the Bighorn Basin. So paleontologists from all over the country, uh, and in many cases, because this is such a famous place to study mammal evolution outside of the country, uh, spend weeks every summer, every summer camped in the badlands of the Bighorn Basin to collect fossils. So here's an example of some of our uh, intrepid PETM time travelers. Um, we're camped on Bureau of Land Management um, land and uh, and that's and that's where we're also collecting the fossils on this on this public land. Um, we have dry camps, um, and so that means you know showers once a week. Um, we all get used to each other though, um, and we like to camp close to the rocks uh, with the fossils, so we can just roll out of our sleeping bags, uh, get a cup of coffee, and start collecting. Uh, to do this, you, you need some equipment. Um, it's not like uh, Florida where you can sometimes just drift down, the, drift down the river or walk the side of the river and look for things. You, very often you have to really get into very remote areas. And sometimes you need equipment um, to be able to get in there and, and collect the fossils correctly. Um, so we have very large uh, and fairly powerful and well-used field vehicles to haul around collecting crews, um, the rocks that we collect um, and to navigate into really fairly remote regions of the Bighorn Basin where people don't often go. Um, and they do suffer a lot of bumps along the way, but the best field vehicles are the ones where you don't mind giving them a few bruises, um, especially when you end up nose first in a drainage, dry uh, river drainage, which happens pretty much every few hours as you're driving through these badlands. So that's part of the experience for our students is learning how to dig out vehicles uh, from drainages once they become high centered, which is always an experience. So there's a question here, why are paleontologists always crawling around on the ground? <laughs> I've been asked that a lot. And the reason for that is because mostly how we find fossils is you could walk around most of the Bighorn Basin, you know, staring at the sky and the beautiful mountains and the horizon, and you're never ever gonna see a fossil. The only way to do it is to look at the ground 
and many of the fossils are pretty small. So you actually won't see them unless you put your face pretty close. Uh, once you do that and you spend some time crawling around an area, things will start to pop out if there are fossils there and, uh, and you'll start to see them. Uh, so you can see right here ne uh, next to Natasha's finger uh, is a little fossil here. That's kind of what it would look like from up above. That's what these fossils look like if you take a little bit closer look to them, look at them. So most of our fossils that we collect are done by surface prospecting, which means crawling around on the top of these ancient soils and collecting them. And that's fine, uh, but it's hard to see the really, really small things. And in fact, we don't collect a lot of really, really small things because they're hard to see. So we, the bigger ones and the medium-sized things are much easier. But that's a problem because most mammals on the planet today are really small. So if you think of rodents and bats, which are two of the most diverse groups of mammals on the planet today, um, they're all pretty small. And presumably that was also maybe even more so the case in the past. So if we really wanna understand how mammals might've been responding to climate change back then, we need to collect those really tiny things. So we didn't a uh, different method um, to, to do that effectively than just crawling around on the ground, which is the standard way. So we do this through what we call screen watching. And okay, we have another question. Just a quick one. So. Um, why were the mammals so small back then when the dinosaurs were so big? So this is, uh, this is after the dinosaurs went extinct. So there's no, no dinosaurs here. We're, we've moved beyond the Mesozoic into the Cenozoic. This is the great time when dinosaurs got wiped out and now mammals are radiating out and doing all kinds of uh, uh, amazing things. Um, and, uh, and in many ways, uh, replacing the dinosaurs in terms of the terrestrial ecology. Why were they so small? Well, I mean, part of the answer is most mammals alive today are really small. Um, it's a good way to be a mammal, um, to, is, is to be small. So that's true today, and that's also true in the past. Um, they, were they proportionally, uh, were, was a greater number of the species smaller than they are today than, than uh, you know, in the past here during the Eocene? Yeah, they, they might, have been, might have been skewing towards smaller body sizes. And that ultimately probably has to do with the fact that this, these first radiations are coming from um, a common ancestor that starts at a fairly, fairly small body size. So it would take some time before um, you start getting the really large sized mammals uh, that you see on the planet today. The largest mammal in this ecosystem was probably about the size of a cow. So if you want to get all those little tiny things, which represent presumably about 80% of the biodiversity back then, like it does today, um, the way we do it is we find, you know, we walk around doing that surface prospecting. And if we find a place that has a lot of little tiny bones on the surface, uh, then we know that that place has potential. We can't really see anything else, just lots of little tiny bones, little bone fragments, you know, little shafts of bone that are broken up, things that you might not, you might not pick up even. Um, so then we uh, take a shovel and we put the sediment um, from that spot into bags. These bags are heavy. Sometimes they're even, you know, they're upwards of 40 pounds each. And we might put a couple of those in our, in our, in our backpacks. Uh, we then pack, we pack them out from where we're bagging the sediment. And then we have to get, get them back to the vehicle wherever we've parked it. And usually that's unfortunately fairly far from where we ultimately end up collecting the fossils. Um, there are restrictions where you can bring those field vehicles in. Um, so uh, that's what uh, really strong grad students are for. Um, although there, that is me actually with a backpack and sediment on my back, but that's an essential part of this job if you wanna, if you wanna see if there are any tiny things there. Uh, the third step is we take that, uh, that dirt, um, this, this uh, eroded you know, dirt that was derived from these ancient soils and we wash them through nested screens in, a, in, in the nearby river of the town of Warland. Um, and people are always walking by and asking whether we're looking for gold. And I suppose it is gold to us. But what we're looking for are fossils. And so uh, through those screens, all the dirt flows out. And what we're left with are little fragments of rock as well as, uh, as, well as the fossils. So we take that concentrate, what we call concentrate, back to the Florida Museum of Natural History. And then over the course of uh, a large number, many months uh, following a field season, under a microscope, we carefully pick through that matrix, throwing away the rocks and keeping the fossils that we find. 
and this is an example of what uh, fossils look like, you know, from that interval. And you'll notice immediately uh, that they're very heavily <laughs> biased towards pieces of jaws um, with teeth in them, uh, as well as just isolated teeth, which I'm not showing you here because they're not as pretty. Uh, but lots and lots and lots and lots of isolated teeth, and then quite a few unassociated postcranial bones, things like um, various pieces of long bones and ankles and things like that, which are sometimes difficult to understand exactly what animals they might go to. That, that forms the record that we're looking at. So what have we figured out uh, with all of these fossils? And um, these are, these are uh, several grad students that I've worked with for years out of the Bighorn Basin. Um, and you can see that, uh, that one of them here, Natasha, can't even bear thinking about uh, what we might have figured out from all those fossils. <laughs> I'm kidding, they figured out a lot. Um, one of the things that we figured out is that or I told you that the first modern primates occur, first occur in the Eocene. Well, they do, but what's most extraordinary is they actually first occur exactly coincident with this very short term massive global warming event. So we see them in the soils, these ancient soils that document this massive global warming event. That's where we see the first record, which is going back here. We get, we get two primates occurring in that record, one that may have given rise to things like lemurs and lorises um, and galagos, and one of them that might have given rise to things like uh, uh, monkeys, uh, apes, and humans um, here. And uh, so we see them first appearing right in exactly the same rocks that document this global warming event. That's when we first see them in the fossil record. And these are the oldest primates, uh, primates that look like modern primates in the world appear in, the, in this climate event um, right there in the Bighorn Basin of Wyoming. Even more remarkable, though, is that we see the first of a lot of things exactly coincident with that climate event right there on those same soils, including the first even-toed ungulates, which are the ancestors of things that would have given rise, hippos and whales. Um, so things that would, and, and also ultimately um, deer and cows, and so artiodactyls and perissodactyls um, and whales. We also see the first odd-toed ungulates, uh, sorry, perissodactyls, but artiodactyls. We see the first uh, odd-toed ungulates, which are the perissodactyls. So we see them, we see them first appearing exactly in the same soils as well. So we see the first even-toed ungulates, the artiodactyls, and the first odd-toed ungulates, the perissodactyls. Uh, which include the uh, ancestors of horses, um, uh, but that also include th things like rhinos and so on. And in fact, um, what you see associated with this climate event is not much in the way of extinction that we've been able to document yet. There may have been a little bit, but not a lot. But we do see the first occurrence of many of the modern orders of mammals that are either exactly coincident with that climate event or, or a bit after. Um, and I like to characterize in Wyoming, just to sum up the last few slides, you literally see the ancestors of cowboys potentially riding on horses and herding cows straight into the climate event. So what else do we see? Uh, we also see another remarkable thing that's happening um, through this climate event, which is we see shifts in mammal body size, at least in some of the mammal lineages. So for example, this one here uh, are those first horses uh, that you see coming into, um, into Wyoming. It's the first fall to record of horses. And when they do come in, this is the beginning of that. When they do come in, uh, this, is, this is body size here. So this is towards smaller, that's towards larger. Um, that's what you're looking at here. When they do come in, they're here. And then as the climate event proceeds and becomes warmer and warmer, and you can see that here by this curve, this is a temperature curve. So as the climate warms, horses get smaller. And then at the end of the event, during what we call the recovery, somehow what happened was that the negative carbon in the atmosphere was, um, was sucked out of the atmosphere and the global warming event ended and it went back to some, some measure of background uh, warmth in, the, in this, in this hothouse world. Um, we see, so the, the, the horses get small as the, as the world cools down at the end of the climate event, and then they stay basically that same size. So the horse body size um, is shifting in relation to climate, in, in relation to paleo temperature, we think. 
And you see this in a number of lineages of mammals. Um, so this is another type of animal, an extinct lineage, not related to anything that's alive today, called ectosian. And it follows a very similar pattern of body size, body size shifts, especially at the end where it becomes larger associated with the recovery period um, of the climate event marking the paleocene eocene boundary. So this seems to be a thing that's happening in multiple lineages across this climate interval. And in fact, we've known uh, that this is something that happens with change in, with differences in temperature, or at least animals that are living in places that, where temperature can be different, um, where you have smaller, smaller uh, mammals occurring in warmer, uh, in warmer, uh, in places with warmer mean annual temperatures. And that's, to, to, to sum it up in a simple way, mammals have stable internal body temperatures, which are maintained by the food that you eat. Um, and as temperature becomes warmer, they need to lose heat to stay at that temperature is one explanation. So um, the idea is one way of thinking about it is that smaller mammals have a higher surface to volume ratio than that of larger mammals, making heat loss more efficient as temperatures warm. Um, or or uh, smaller mammals also get um, uh, colder a lot faster as temperatures drop. And when I think of, for example, if I were to walk outside with my daughter who has uh, quite a bit smaller than I am, she gets cold a lot faster just because she has quite a different surface to body uh, to volume uh, ratio. Uh, there are many other variables that could play into why we see animals, sh mammals shrinking uh, during this global warming event, which includes potentially related um, variables in uh, related to rainfall, nutrient availability, reproductive shifts in reproductive biology, but all of them could ultimately potentially be tied into some aspect of climate change. Yep. So a question though that came through was, so that's, um, you know, less, or the mammals are getting smaller, but then the actual, I've heard that insects could be getting bigger in warmer climates. So it doesn't apply to everyone. This is just mammals that we see this kind of trend in, right? Well, mammals and insects have very different physiology. So uh, mammals um, have a, uh, you know, derive the, 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 mammals maintain their body heat uh, through the food that they eat versus an insect where it's just much more affected by the ambient temperature, um, which, I'll, which I'll show you in the next slide. Um, so insects have a very different relationship with climate. And going back into the, uh, into the PETM during this time, we don't really have much evidence in terms of, that I know of in terms of body size in insects, but we do see uh, during this climate interval, uh, a big increase in uh, leaf. Uh, so if you look at fossil leaves in damage to um, fossil leaves, showing that there was something going on with insects during this time, um, at least through the, uh, through that type of evidence. Um, it's a little bit harder to document what's going on with insects based on body fossils, just because there's a little bit of a bias towards recovery of those in the fossil record. So on the other hand, this sort of gets the idea, the issue in, of an insect is um, reptiles, which are, are, are an example of animals that have body temperatures that are instead dependent on ambient environmental temperatures, not the food that they eat, but, you know, but what the external temperature was like you know, outside of their body. Um, because of this different physiology, the maximum size of reptiles, including snakes very notably, uh, can be limited by the mean annual temperature. So um, if you go to the warmest places today, you'll see the largest snakes alive today. That tends to be on the equator. Um, the only way you could theoretically build a larger snake would be to increase the temperature at the equator where it's the warmest. Um, so uh, if we go to the Paleocene, which was 58 million years ago, when the earth was much warmer than it was today, as you might remember from that diagram that I was showing you all, um, our expectation that we should see larger reptiles is met. Um, so this is an example of this uh, from animal that we discovered uh, many years ago that got a lot of attention just because I think it just messed with people's imagination to a certain extent. Um, we found uh, in the Paleocene when the earth was a lot warmer, we found a you know, evidence for a giant snake much larger than anything alive today, Titanoboa uh, from the tropics of Colombia, which was about 58 million years ago. And Titanoboa was somewhere between 42 and 49 feet long. You would like to say if it was slithering, slithering by you, it's, you know, it's the, the snake would have come up to somewhere around, you know, between your knee and your hip or something like that for, for a large, you know, for a large animal. So it's, it's um, quite extraordinary to think about. 
um, it would have weighed a lot and it could have eaten very large prey, um, probably um, mostly the kinds of things you would find in a very aquatic environment, freshwater aquatic environment where it lived. So, um, so that really meets expectations, sort of the flip side of, you know, of what happens. And so during, you know, warming periods or periods that are already very warm, we should expect to see, you know, during warming periods, see shrinking mammals or small mammals. Um, we also see giant reptiles uh, when the earth was warmer than it is today, um, especially in the tropics. And I think it really just underlines now this theme where we have to, we, we really should think a little bit outside the box when we're thinking about the future. Um, the fossils, uh, as they're recorded in the rocks, are data from natural experiments that have been run for us for free uh, that allow us to test, I, test about how plants and animals might respond to climate change in a way that you really can't do uh, in modern ecological experiments and you wouldn't want to do. Um, and the only experiment that we're really going to be able to see outside of the fossil record will be the one that's happening over the next couple of hundred years or even more. We'll, we'll start to see the effects of that we're already starting to see a, a, at least the initial effects of what that could look like. Um, so that, ex that uh, is not incredibly satisfying because, you know, once we're there, um, it's going to be difficult to have planned for it in the future. So that's why I would argue um, going back, uh, you know, for relatively cheap uh, to look at these massive global experiments and global warming um, is worthwhile and a good use of public lands. Yep. So there's a bit of debate between our watchers. Some are loving the info on the giant snakes. I'm personally not as thrilled about the idea of a giant snake. Uh, I find that a bit terrifying. Um, but uh, the question is, is, is that something we can expect with global warming or in climate change to start seeing larger reptiles? Yeah, uh, that, that's an obvious question and one that I've answered a bunch of times. Um, so the, the question is, with global warming, are we going to see titanoboa sized snakes in, you know, on the equator? And uh, the answer is theoretically, yes, we could. Um, in other words, as, you know, as we warm up the planet, then that, that will allow you know, the ambient temperatures to be warm enough to build a snake of that proportions. However, it's extremely unlikely that that will happen, um, uh, mainly because of habitat loss in areas like that. It require incredible habitat to maintain a snake of that size. Um, and and other factors um, that would go into it, mostly having to do with interactions with humans um, that would make that uh, probably not possible. Um, so, so either sadly or thankfully, depending on how you look at it, probably no Titanoboa sized snakes in our future. So what have we learned about uh, going, you know, our time travel? We've learned that uh, this climate event, um, it, which, which seems so potentially devastating, um, also has another story to it, which is that without it, we don't exist. It marks the origin of a bunch of mammal groups that we consider very important uh, on the planet today, including the ancestors of us, um, as well as the ancestors of things like horses, cows, camels, pigs. Uh, we also see that there's a response in mammals where they change their geographic ranges um, as their preferred habitats change. And it's not something I really talked about here, but it's, but it's really important. Um, but we're seeing that in the record. Um, we see that some small mammals can become smaller with climate change. Reptiles have the potential to become larger. Uh, but there's a lot that we still don't know, um, especially for the mammals. And that's why we need more fossils and why we continue this work, even though we've been doing it for so long. Um, so with that, I will uh, thank, just a broad thanks to all of the many field crews that have been out there collecting fossils over the years, many colleagues, students, um, and so on. Uh, we've had a lot of funding from the National Science Foundation, which I acknowledge here, and tremendous support from the Bureau of Land Management. Um, we, of course, collected all of these fossils with the correct permits through the BLM, uh, but they've given us so much support in, in so many different ways uh, to work on this public land and, and continue to do so. And then with that, uh, that finishes the presentation. Thank you so much. That was amazing. I'm 
always been really fascinated by this kind of stuff. So that was very exciting to hear about and learn more about. So thank you. Uh, we do have some questions that came through that I was waiting to the end. Um, so one is, what's your favorite fossil that you have found? Or what's your favorite fossil in general? Oh, I have so many favorite fossils. I, you know, just it depends on what time of the day you ask me, I guess, as to what my favorite fossil is. Um, uh, I, you know, I have a special place in my heart for, for fossils that have exceptional preservation. So ones where you can really see, you know, the beautiful outline of, of what would have been the soft, soft part preservation. So I have a number, there are a number of fossils going back into the Eocene preserved, for example, in the Green River Formation, which is, which is, in the, which is also in Wyoming, the, in the Green River Basin, um, that, I, uh, that are some of my favorite fossils, including the incredible uh, impressions of bats in the fossil record there. But I think if I was really pressed, the fossil that is, that's my favorite um, is one that we found um, a number of years ago now, which is the skeleton of an animal called Carpolestes, which uh, I think might be related to the ancestor of primates in the Paleocene. And uh, what was neat about that skeleton was that its big toe uh, showed, um, the, the bones of its big toe showed that it had an evidence for a nail. Um, on its toe, which was the first evidence for a nail and lineage leading to primates. That's amazing. Um, so and the next question was, is we actually have Morales's fourth grade class that's been watching this whole presentation. Oh. They wanted to thank you. Um, they were so excited to get to meet a real live paleontologist. <laughs> um, and so with that, some of the questions that came in, including from Thomas was, how can I become a paleontologist professionally? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, a good step early on is, you know, is collecting fossils is a, is a, is a good step. Um, and, and reading about and learning about the fossils is also incredible. And as a, as a younger person, um, you know, if you ever get an opportunity to go to mm -hmm. one of the major museums that, that, that exists, um, in, in this country and elsewhere, you should definitely make, make the time to go to a museum because it can inspire you. Uh, you know, going through those exhibits and seeing those fossils is a lot different than just reading about them. And that's important, that inspiration is important for, for your future as a, as a paleontologist. Um, you'll look at those things and you'll have questions. And that's the, that's the big thing is if you become, if you become engaged in early on in paleontology with the questions, um, then as you move through uh, your education, uh, those questions will always be in the back of your mind and they'll be part of what motivates you to learn about science. So in the future, you can try to address some of those questions that you're so curious about. And when you get to, when you get to college, you wanna go out of your way to take courses in both geology and <laughs> biology. Um, paleontology is kind of a cross disciplinary mm -hmm. um, science. And, um, and, uh, then the final thing I would say is, is do a lot of reading. There are, there's a lot that's been published in the last 150 years about vertebrate paleontology. And your, your task is to figure out what people still don't know so that that can provide you with your motivation moving forward to become a paleontologist as a professional. That's right. So English is important, even if you're a scientist guy. <laughs> go, to, go to your language arts classes. <laughs> yep. um, so we had a question from Ted. What caused the abrupt change from warm to the start of the ice age? So what caused that change that happened? Uh, yeah, we were going like warm, 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 and then we, we switched to yeah, going Yeah, so now we're, cold, we're fast forwarding way towards, mm -hmm. yeah. So this, that's related to, to changes in, in tectonics uh, on the planet, um, related to, to, to plate movements um, and changes in ocean circulation that allowed mm -hmm. for um, the formation of, uh, of ice at the poles. Great. And then the last question we have um, is from Monica. They were wondering, what can they do to get involved or kind of get a taste of paleontology? Is there any like citizen science projects they can do or anything like that? <sighs> yeah. Well, you're so lucky. Everybody, I mean, if you're, <laughs> if you're on this, if you, if you all are on this, uh, and you're from Florida. I mean, I know, I know there might be people who are not from Florida, um, but if you're from Florida, you're especially lucky because there are fossils everywhere in this, in this state. And 
you can do you can do a lot of things. I mean, you can go look for fossils. You have to do you know you can if you want to look for vertebrate fossils, you can get a fossil collecting permit for something like five bucks, and you can go on to um, certain parts of types of public land and and collect fossils on your own. Um, but the other thing you're really that that you're that's lucky is that there are places where you can go. For example, here at the Florida Museum of Natural History, we run um, public programs. For example, the site behind me is the Montbrook Fossil Site outside of Williston here in North Florida, um, in Levy County, and it's a uh, it's on private land, and the landowners have been working with us and are letting us uh, dig on this property. And what this hole is behind us is is uh, is sediments that are between five and six million years old and represent an ancient river in Florida. And we've had many hundreds of people volunteering with us over the last four years uh, um, to, to, to help dig up these fossils. Um, so we have, we generally in non-COVID years, um, we will, in fact, I'm, I, I'm assuming that some of the people who've dug with us at the site are probably uh, watching this talk. Um, and are waiting very patiently so for us to start again. Um, so as soon as it's safe, we will. But in non-COVID years, we run digs in both the fall and the spring, generally not the summer, which is too hot and wet. Um, yeah. But when it's during the drier parts of the fall and spring, we run public programs there where people can come and dig with us. Um, and it's exciting because you, you get to be part of, it's not just a public program, you're actually part of the science. So we're actually digging this place because we're interested and we have scientific questions. So you're part of the, you're engaged in the scientific aspect of the, so that's that's one way to get involved. That's amazing. Well, and if people want more information about that, where can they go? So you can go to the Florida Museum of Natural History website. Um, and if you go to the Division of Vertebrate Paleontology there, there should be links to the Montbrook fossil site and how to get involved. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much again, Dr. Block. We loved having you and learning about all of the amazing discoveries that you've helped make over the years. Um, and we can't wait to see what's next. You're when welcome. We find Thanks out. so much for having me. I wish I so could I know who was, who was out there. Really, I've only seen you, so I don't know who else was out there. <laughs> Thanks everyone else for coming to my talk. <laughs> yes, well, you can always rewatch the videos. These are get posted and recorded, so you can always rewatch them later um, and add comments in the future if you'd like. And then uh, we want to thank our sponsor again, Miami Downtown Development Authority, for supporting us for this event and our partners, the National Park Services and University of Florida. I got it right that time. And um, the next virtual live at Frost Science will be November 18th with Chemical Kim. So we hope to see you then and have a wonderful rest of your afternoon, everyone. Thank you for watching.